everyone, and welcome to TFYLP, Transformers for Your Listening Pleasure, episode... I'm not sure which episode this is, because we're kind of uh, getting that out of the way right now. <laughs> um, this is kind of a, a, a show that we're we're going to uh, put aside for uh, for a rainy day, because sometimes it's really difficult to get cast together, and uh, if I'm not available or Brett's not available, uh, it makes it really difficult to go live. So we, we have one of these in the can as much as we can, and this is one of those episodes. So... Um, but the so, types of so episodes that we have are the types of episodes you can listen to them anytime. It's not dated. It's not like what, uh, what's happening on the week of uh, of May fifteenth, two thousand fifteen. You know, uh, so you know you can listen to this a year from now, and it hopefully will be entertaining and inter- informative uh, for you five years from now. Yeah, we're TFYOP whatever number point one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, actually, the file name for this episode is episode XXX. So maybe we can oh, get drunk. Oh, I don't great! Know. So, so who gets to be what's his name? The, we're a jug band today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I am your host, Ron Land, aka Weird Wolf. Along with me this evening is Megmus. Hello, hello. Headmaster Don. Hey, buddy. And Proto Man. How you doing? So uh, we're, we got together tonight, and we're going to uh, talk about a couple topics. Uh, first of the topics, we've talked before uh, about the hows of uh, displaying your collection. You know, how do you display your collection? Is it in lighted glass cases? Is it on, on a, uh, on a uh, bookshelf? Or are they just laying in piles in the middle of the floor? You know, <laughs> literally, there's people that do that, you know. <laughs> Look at Brett. You know, he points to the pile behind him. Um, Boxes! <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, there's different ways people display collections and everything. We've talked about the hows. Uh, but tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the whys of collection. Why do you bother cl- uh, displaying your collection? Uh, I've gotten into some display uh, discussions here the last uh, couple weeks and it's kind of made me think of, along those lines so we're going to talk a little bit about that and then we're also going to speak on the uh, on the terms of going to conventions uh, we're going to look at it from the attendees point of view from the dealers point of view uh, and from the uh, con staff point of view um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, before we get uh, started, I want to uh, point out our sponsors, CapturePrey.com. Great toys, great prices, great service. CapturePrey.com, where you can save even more on orders of $150 or more with free domestic shipping. And if you're inter- if you are an international uh, purchaser from CapturePrey, you get discounted shipping if you order $150 or more. CapturePrey.com, great toys, great prices, and great service. Also, Mega Toy Fan, maximize your collection while minimizing your cost with MegatoyFan.com. You can find him at JoeCon. You can find him at TFCon uh, Canada and USA. You can also find him at, uh, let's see, your Pete's Robot Convention if, uh, mm-hmm. if you're going to that. So yep. uh, check him out uh, wherever you go. And also, if you love what we do, we have a Patreon page at Patreon.com slash, pat- uh, slash TFYP. I'm sorry. Patreon.com slash TFYLP. Without your help, we couldn't continue with this show. Uh, it helps uh, pay our bills as far as server space, um, upgrading equipment, things of that nature. Uh, so I want to thank everybody who continues to help us each and every month. Also, if you uh, order from Ripped Apparel, RippedApparel.com, they have some great Transformers-related T-shirts. I'm wearing one right now. It's a uh, uh, GPS, uh, evil GPS t-shirt. Uh, it was <laughs> Love available, that one. Yeah, last year's uh, TFCon USA. Um, matter of fact, it may even still be available on their website. I'm not sure. But if you use the promo code TFYLPPOD, uh, you can save 10% on your order at, t- at Ripped Apparel. So uh, check those out. So guys, uh, displaying your collections. Um, you know, if you look behind me, if you're watching the video of this, you see that uh, I've got lighted glass cases behind me. I, and I've got one to my, to my right here. There's another one uh, over uh, in the corner to my right. You know, for years and years and years, I displayed my toys on wooden 
bookshelves that I bought at Walmart. Always, always having to dust them constantly because, like, dust settles on my toys, you know, and dust is the bane of, uh, of a good toy collection. You know, I mean, you, you walk up and you see a nice display and then you look closely and it's covered in a layer of dust. That's, that's a pain in the ass. I hate that. Um, you still have to dust from time to time with glass cases, but not as, not as often, quite frankly, because not as much dust gets into them. Uh, we've spoken uh, before about uh, how do you display your collections. And uh, see, Don, he's got uh, plastic shelving behind him, and oh, they I've, sit there. I, I got plastic shelving. I've got wooden bookcases. I've got that fake wood-looking stuff. That's the no tools required shelves. Oh, I like have, you get at Walmart? <laughs> no, like I had. I, I have more mixed media in my apartment than a library. <laughs> I mean, it's literally on. It's on the couch. Oh, I'm just playing stuff on the couch. It reminds me, you know, back whenever <laughs> people wonder why I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it reminds me back. Uh, I was talking just last night, actually, on Facebook. Uh, somebody was, uh, I think, Sergio was uh, speaking about uh, his collection. He had some uh, some things in a tote up in the attic, and then there was another guy said here's my collection and he showed lots of lots and lots of totes and uh, i'm like that's impressive but you know how do you how do you enjoy that you know uh and I, and i reminisced because my collection in its heyday i had several bookcases uh full of my collection i had one entire wall wallpapered with carded toys i had um i want to say 15 total totes and I'm talking the big, deep, wide, long plastic totes, uh, full to the brim of uh, carded and loose toys that I just didn't have room to display somewhere. Uh, I had um, a bookshelf that had like alternators standing on it uh, in front of the books. And then I had an entertainment center. Remember those, a lot of people still have them, but. I had an entertainment center, wooden entertainment center. The top of the entertainment center was lined with all of the G1 com uh, combiners in combined form, with the exception of Monstructor. Had them all lined up along the top. Uh, and then inside of each of the cubby holes in the entertainment center, except for one uh, where I had my uh, Nintendo 64. That tells you long, how long ago this was. Um, all the cubby holes was filled with the book style reissues and then the loose versions in front of them. And then, yeah, I mean, I had them, I had stuff everywhere in this apartment. Uh, now, you know, I've had a big sell off. There's no toys outside of this room that I'm in right now. Uh, and I have a much smaller collection that I have. Um, that is how I display my collection. Um, I'm gonna stop talking here because I because uh, I know I get on a, on a long ra ramble. But uh, we're talking about tonight. Why do you sp uh, display your collection? Why do you go? Wh why do I? You know, like I personally, I know Daniel's uh, behind him. He's got glass cases. Uh, um, Brett's got glass cases uh, behind him. Um, why do you even bother displaying your collections? What, uh, is there what is there a motivation behind it? Is it uh, for personal enjoyment? Uh, do you display it so that you can enjoy it and other people? Uh, have you ever thought about that? Well, I, I, I'll go. I'll go next because I'm probably going to be the most brief. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I've, I've always wanted a room to display my stuff. Ever since I got back into collecting, back in '95 with the Beast Wars era. And it got me back into G1, and I always wanted a room. And mine actually started out as a closet. And basically, I took the doors off the closet, and that was that's all I had, was that little space. And that was in an old house. And then uh, when I got into this house, I decided I was going to put it in the basement. And, Duran, you've seen it. I yeah. built a big, big coffin-type three-tier bookshelf. And what I mean by that, it was 20 feet by 8 feet tall. I built it. And uh, I had all my stuff in there. And then uh, 
when my oldest son moved out, I got this room. So I decided to put everything in here. That is when I started doing the glass display cases. Uh, so the basically detoss, you came out of the closet at that, at that time. Well, yeah, unlike you that have <laughs> well, not yet, but yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, say it, that. Basically, that's, basically, that's Brett's sewing room is what it boils down to. Pretty much. This is my, my sanity room. This is where I go to gain my sanity. Sa- your I sanity went, through insanity. Glass. Well, the main reason I went with glass is because, like you say, um, less dusting and everything. Bull crap. I don't know how it gets in there, but there's still dust in there. Well, I'm not, I'm yeah. not, I didn't. I said it didn't didn't prevent. Oh no, no, dust. I'm saying that that's why I did it. I agree with you, but then you find out, yeah, you still got a dust. So, um, the long and short of it is, um, no, this isn't everything. All my carded beast Wars stuff is still packed away down in the basement, um, and yeah, I've got I've got stuff stacked everywhere in boxes and everything, just trying to go through everything to to see if I can display it. But I also restrict myself to this room. Uh, the wife has told me I could go ahead and, you know, wherever I want to put the stuff and expand and everything. And I'm like, nope, nope. I, I limit myself to this much space. And when the space runs out, I either sell or I stop buying toys. And that's that's how I do it. Um, and I the main reason I do it is for uh, I enjoy looking at them. I enjoy it. I, I love look over here, and I see my my whole collection of Hot Toys, uh, DC and Marvel figures. I love those. I go over here, and I see all my masterpiece, all my G one boxed, uh, all the uh, other masterpiece and third party and prototypes and everything. I I love it. I love to to organize it, and I spend a lot of time, probably more than I should, uh, organize it and reorganize it. But it. It's a way for me to get away from the world and to do recoup ever, my. Let me ask you this, and I, and I'll, I'll I'll flat out say that I do this from time to time, even if I'm don't come in here to actually do anything, you know, like work on the computer or get something. Uh, do you ever just go into your room, your collection room, turn on the light, and stand and look at stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, but and it's and it but makes they, and it makes you relax. Well, uh, yeah, but usually it's where the hell did I put that? Because I can't remember. That's usually what I'm doing. I'm like, <laughs> or or I just bought something. And I'll go over and it'll be sitting there, and I'll have two of it, and I'll like. That, it, uh, <laughs> so, that happens a lot too. Uh, I do. I, this is one thing. And I'm kind of curious if anyone else does it because if you are, you're you're about as crazy as I am. Um, I'll be at work, work, work. And all of a sudden, I'll get the idea of, you know, if I moved all my masterpiece over to this display case, I could save this much more room and the height and everything. And that's what I'm going to do this weekend. I'm going to, and I get excited because I'm going to move my stuff, and I get excited about that. Yeah. And then I don't do it. But that's not <laughs> the point because um, it's too much work. But I was just curious. Anyone else done that? Just yeah. Not even in the room. Well, nothing. Just think about it. And well, get, you know, I'm going to. Well, but, I'm going to have so much fun doing that. Yeah, basically, you love planning the way it'll look at when you're when you when you're finally done, and then when you get to the room to do it, it's like, oh hell no, this yeah, will be a just, task. It's <laughs> like work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So yeah, that in a nutshell, that's it. Yes. So uh, uh, the whys of your collection is basically, uh, or whys of your displays is basically just for personal enjoyment. You don't yes. you don't really display it in a in a manner that you know if somebody came over they'd be like wow no uh, there's very few I mean some people have been up here and they've seen it and everything I have, you know yeah so I mean that's but but mostly it's just you know your your inner sanctum this is where you, oh, you massy chill. attack yeah so this is where you chill and to me that's important it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> So, Don, how do you display your Massey? I mean, your collection. Massey. <laughs> hey, yo, wherever, wherever he wants to be, basically. Uh, I'm kind of unique in the fact that I'm not married. I don't have a girlfriend. I doubt I'm ever going to get married because this is what they're getting, and that's not going to be a you know that's not going to be a high selling item there. Uh, but uh, I display it. 
because I think these figures, for the most part, are basically miniature works of art to a, to a degree. The sculpting, the color, the boxes. There's figures that I love the boxes more than the, toy. the figure itself, the packaging art. It seems uh, on my photo bucket account. You see, y'all see my photo bucket account with my G Gundam or my GoBot, the GoBots that I got from Brent last week are going on my carded wall because they're art. It's artwork to me, and this is basically my precious moments or my Hamilton collection or whatever thing you collect that you display. This is it for me. Now. Unfortunately, again, being single, and I'm going to cuss here, my shit is everywhere. It literally is everywhere in every room that I possess. I think even I've even the bathroom, Don. Yes, because oh lord, <laughs> wow. Well, the well, the what's in my the house, house is crazy, but it's not that crazy. Yeah. Well, okay. Most people read a can of uh, Glade or surf their, uh, the internet on their okay. cell phone while they're on if, the can. Don picks I, up a box and reads a text page. <laughs> well, no, in this case, I had just gotten you got like a stack of Cybertron card backs. Yeah. No, no. It was it was the Unique Toys Triple Changing Sandstorm Sorter, and I was looking at the instruction manual. <laughs> it's a big instruction manual. So I was just reading that in lieu of a magazine. But anyway... <laughs> I would, I would, I need to be like, and I've thought about this before. I've been collecting since I was 14 years old. That was 1984. That's over 30 years of collecting. I've got some crap. I need to sell it, and I'm, I'm trying to make myself sell it. But so much good stuff keeps coming out. It's like I find myself wanting to go back and buy some Exo Squad figures just for the boxes that I don't have anymore because the boxes are. Are beautiful, you know. I've you know I've got I picked up at at uh, Joe Lana. I picked up the Resolute, gorgeous, gorgeous box and and, and ship, and I, I display it for me. When people like mostly my landlord or related people come over, they just sort of get this look that they don't understand what I have, and it's like. They have yes, more of have a, a why look on their face. Yeah, it's like why do you why do you have all this kid stuff? And it's like I don't want to collect, you know, cars and have, I couldn't do any living in an apartment. I couldn't have six cars out there to be fixed if I even if I was mechanically inclined. Oh but, you come know, on, I, Don, I you're in Virginia. That's normal. <laughs> I failed. Secret about me, no one knows. I failed high school shop with a D minus. <laughs> How do you feel high school shop? In my case, brilliantly. <laughs> so my stuff is displayed because I think it's works of art. You can tell. You you can see to a degree. I, I haven't got a lot of lights on. The the art that Dan did for this Fortress Maximus for the Genesis eighty eight mile an hour book. I bought all of his line art. I bought all of his line art for Fortress Max. That is one of my prized pieces right there. So I have all seven pieces of his line art. Um, I've got excerpts from the uh, Japanese magazines for Dagwon. I've got Primus's box from Japan on the wall because that o that O O Primus box when he came out in Japan. G one G one inspired so yeah Galaxy mm -hmm. Force exactly. box. That's a gorgeous, and speaking of Primus, that, that new coming up Primus is so G2. It makes me just want to squee because it's gorgeous. Where's Jason? But, uh, is he going to pop on? <laughs> probably. I said G2, but I love it. But anyway, my well, stuff is displayed time. for me, but I want to get to the point where I'm like Duran. I can have a normal life in the rest of my house or apartment, but I have my one room that I can walk in and be like Brent and say, this is my sanctuary. And why are you biting my feet? Brett, why are you biting his feet? <laughs> <sighs> no, the, fu the fuzzy. <laughs> he's, the one that's biting my feet is fuzzier than him. But I'm, I'm clean shaven. Point. Yeah. I've got too much stuff. We've talked about this before. That's why it's displayed. Because I think this stuff is awesome. And anybody can have collector's plates on the wall. Well, no, the no offense to Scotty. No offense to my, my I do have a Hamilton collector's plate Scotty over there, which I love my Hamilton Scotty plate. 
can you see? Collector's plates. Yeah. yeah. I've got uh, the all the box ones. Ones. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, all I was going to say in, in reference to that is look at look at the G1 stuff I have that's sealed, boxed and everything. It's the same thing. Am I playing with those toys? No. No. They're, they're works of art. The actual how, box how artwork just... and everything. And Duran, you know about that because you've done a lot of box artwork too. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I mean, it, it, I agree with you 100%. They are works of art. And how many of us bought the Legacy book? Even though we've seen this artwork for years Solid. and years and years, we all bought this book because it literally is work of art. And Steve at Joe Lynn, I'm going to do a quick tangent. He, Steve is working on saving the ads that Transformers used to be in the 70s, 80s, in the 80s and 90s, the print ads. He's working on saving all those those print ads because you don't see Transformers and cell papers anymore, very rarely. And those are kind of artwork too. Usually very bad, but it's also it also is kind of an artwork because you and know, their charm. It, it, exactly. And you know, that if you if you had taken some of his artwork that he showed off at Joanna, which was I mean, really huge layouts when they first came out, like like, like a whole page of nothing but Transformers. Silver Blue Streak, Jazz. 787 on sale, you know, back in the day. But you could frame those, and that would be like a com same thing as a comic strip you would frame if you had Gil Kane sign a Batman or whatever the case may be. So, again, that's that's why my stuff is displayed because I think they're miniature works of art, except for Beast Machines. That's the end of my mind. You know, uh, you bring up a good point there, Don. Um, you know, it's like, I, you know, I said earlier that I don't have toys outside this room. You know, I've, well, I've got, I think I got my Kabaya Fort Max sitting on a, on a shelf in there, but that's, I don't really consider that, you know, it's uh, just sitting in there because I really didn't have anywhere in here to put it. Um, it's a candy dispenser. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, but I do have posters in there. Um, and I agree with you, these toys, each toy, uh, even outside of its box is in and of itself a work of art. Uh, mm -hmm. I view it that way. You and uh, you know a lot of us uh, collectors do. I mean, in a way, they are great works of art. But to the outside person who is not a collector, um, who uh, you know, their idea of art is more two D rather than three D. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess is what I'm trying to say they would have a hard time viewing it that way. And it's like what you said, you know, your landlord or somebody, you know, a, a repairman may come over, they look in your apartment and they're like, oh my God, you know, they don't see works of art. They see kids' toys everywhere, you know. Uh, and that's that's that also goes in and with the stigma that we've we've actually talked about here on the show. You know, collectors... Are we just weird or, you know, why do we have this stigma that we have? Um, you know, it, it, we see each other, you know, we, we know everybody that's listening to this show pretty much and everybody that's on this show, we get it. We know why we do it We because we love these toys and we know, you know. I don't know why I do it. You don't, just, no. No, I just you crazy. Just, you do it for profit because you're a dealer. I'm just, I'm just nuts. <laughs> I think I'm yes. just nuts. He's rainmaker, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Daniel knows what I'm referring to. Um, but um, uh, but it's 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 different whenever you talk about other people coming in and looking at it. Um, but I do have posters and photographs uh, in uh, other areas of my apartment, and I'm not saying I, I have tons of them. But I have maybe, I think, four in the living room and two in the dining room area, which I've actually converted into my little light box studio. Uh, since I don't dine in there, it's usually on the couch. <laughs> but um, the, that is not as strange to visitors, as uh, per se, I, I guess. Um, they may wonder why I've got pictures of cartoon characters or comic book characters or toys on the wall but at least it's it's cool artwork you know i can I pass it off even if i don't want them to see this collection i can close my door and they wouldn't know anything about it just that i think they're cool characters and i have them hanging on my wall um so 
it's it's all about perception, I guess. Um, you know, who's perceiving it, uh, and it's uh, the reason I don't display toys outside of this room is not necessarily because I'm afraid of what people will think, and it goes more along the lines of what you were talking about, Don. It's like Transformers is a large part of my life. I love Transformers. I, I think about them every day, but they aren't my life. There, I have other aspects of my life that I want to enjoy, and I don't want to have to think about Transformers all the time. So, you know, if I sit in my living room, uh, if I want to watch a movie or play a video game, I, you know, I don't necessarily need toys around me to do that. Uh, Daniel, why do you display the way you display? I I uh, I didn't have a choice. Um, I was born into a house of collectors. Yeah, recruit. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, my earliest memories and my earliest photos that I have as a child, still even wearing a diaper, my father used to uh, put all my diecast Hot Wheel toys on shelving in like a display of like toy shelving. Uh, he was a toy collector, still is a toy collector to this day. Um, Which and, I'm sure is awesome having a parent that understands. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's that's kind of, again, like it, when it goes to the why, is that when you grow up in an environment where your father has this separate room in the house that all these toys, or as he referred to them, daddy's toys, um that you're not allowed it's actually he would actually say papa's toys but that'd be in french so i don't want to confuse people um you know uh that i wasn't allowed to touch but they were just like museum displayed and you're, you're talking 1983 84 glass cases and and fluorescent lighting back then like style museum style my father was a carpenter and and uh an architect so he also had that advantage too where he could build something beautiful for himself in our little duplex that we used to live in back in the day. And I was inspired by that from a young age, growing up where, and I, I used to have, just like in my mind, I would always imagine how my collection would look one day. Where I, you know, the, I remember when I was really like in the, in the early 90s when I was really into comic books, like X-Men, Spider-Man, stuff like that, just imagining like having like, a display almost similar to that of a comic book store, you know, where I just have like just long boxes everywhere and posters and stuff like that. But knowing that it was a reality because I had a father who made that a reality in the house that I lived in with his collection. And whenever I had toys, for some odd reason, I also had shelving in a display that he would put up. He was the one who taught me how to, you know, put accessories into boxes, not to lose them stuff like that. So the why comes from just uh, inspiration from my dad. And when I really, really got deep back into Transformers, much like Brett with the Beast era and everything, um, it got to a point that I was like, I want to have a crazy display like my father does for his dinkies, corgi, his diecast stuff. So I started at first just using uh, typical wooden shelving, you know, and when you, you when you have a collection that at, the, at that time maybe ranged 13, 14 figures, after a year it grows to 100, 200, after two years, you know, just domino effect and it got bigger and bigger to the point that, and you, then you're in a house where you have one guy who has a huge toy collection, then you have a son that has a huge toy collection and it's kind of like the battle of the space if in anything, it's like, son, did you take my uh, my display down? <laughs> well, he, he had he had his own separate room in the house, just dedicated to his stuff in the basement. We called it uh, the the record cave or the vinyl cave, where he had all his vinyl records and all his diecast cars, lights, jukebox, like just absolutely inspiring. When I would see what he did, and going like, one day I want to do that, where I'll have my own house and my own family, and I'll have a room just dedicated solely to that and it was a huge room too because he just took over a basement and that why came from you know buying a house myself and converting 50% of the house into that not just a room but 
50 and I'm very I'm very OCD in the sense that the why of why I display I like the museum kind of look of it everything is sorted by year and then faction and it's just like you know 84 85 86 87 it just it goes like that and it continues all around the room every single wall and then because I'm so OCD this room only transformers nothing else not not anything else is allowed to be displayed with that then i have another room just video game stuff just video game stuff and video game action figures and video game merchandise then i have another room that's the miscellaneous room that's the marvel dc ninja turtle street sharks you know all the the you know ultraman sentai power rangers that's the miscellaneous room but why do i do it i'll tell you this right now I would like to believe that I do it to show it to other people, but I'm not even a big fan of having people overseeing the collection because I, I, I don't want to say I get nervous about it, but it's, I mean, I have an alarm system. I have all that kind of stuff, but I got a lot of stuff again to, know. to swear like Don. I got a lot of shit, a lot of shit. Um, I mean, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. And but at least it's displayed cleanly. You know, like it doesn't look like a cluttered mess. Again, because I'm kind of OCD with that, I want to make sure everything has its you, place. You're not necessarily and, embarrassed if somebody comes over. Oh, and no, sees no. It. It, well, that's, that's the one thing. When, when I'll have um, an electrical guy come or something, and, you know, they have to go to the breaker box and they have to go through the basement. Um, the only fear I have is, oh no, someone now knows that this valuable stuff exists here. You know, that's more my fear. It's not yep. because, if anything, I'm proud of it more than anything because if they see it, it looks it looks so spectacular in person. It's a museum the way that I display it. There is nothing messy about it. But at the same time, the other part of me is just like, oh my god, if he's someone that knows this stuff is valuable, it's. I mean, I've always said, like, you know, you go to BotCon, and if someone knows you ain't home, <laughs> you know, mm. like, you know, it's like, it's, it's, that's a fear I have of it many times, and why I actually, I don't sell a lot in the fandom, because I don't want people to have my home address, you know, like, they, they don't need to have that information, because, <laughs> you know, they don't need to know that, so that's why I usually sell a lot on eBay, where it's complete strangers, it's not like a direct thing. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's the why comes from, I think that it's like Brett said, it's just super enjoyable. Just the kind of stand there sometimes, like usually before I go to bed, I'll just kind of like, you know, I shut down the computer and I, I stand up and all the display lights are still on before I leave the room and you just, you just take it in, you know, mm -hmm. you just go, wow. You know, like I'll usually like, I'll go to like, I like to go to the, to the G1 vintage section and I like to slide the doors open and just like stare at the Master Force stuff just for a bit and pick something up that I probably maybe have not touched for maybe a year, two years, three years and just went mess with it. You know, oh, I'm going to pick up cross blades, you know, the pretender, just, you know, just get reacquainted with an old friend, if anything. And it's just like stuff like that. I just really, and you know, and it's just, you know, then I go to like, even like when you get to the 2000 stuff with, with car robots and into beast machines and G2, which is late nineties. But, um, you know, I, I just enjoy just kind of soaking it in. And I mean, that's kind of why, because I never wanted to be that guy that had everything in boxes. And I was that guy at one point because when the Bay movie started coming out, more product was coming out than I ever had space to display it, or dare I say, time to even open it, because I was a completist of that stuff. So more stuff, you know, like you would take a trip to, I don't want to say Zeller's, because no American would know what that is, but Target. Um, you would take to a Target equivalency, pick up literally everything of that wave, and we're talking Legends, Fast Action Battlers, Deluxes, Leaders, Voyagers, and you're, you're, you literally, after one trip from one wave, you have like 18 figures, I mean, I'm sorry, you don't, got, you don't even have a whole evening to open all of that and really soak it in. So it got to a point like that, and, and I just, when I moved, I made sure, get a big effing house. Get a big, beautiful effing house, and just 50% of it will just be 
And the way that my house is designed, the whole bottom, because it's, it's a split level, which is like you kind of have four floors. The two bottom floors, which is the basement and the ground level, is all geek culture. All the geek culture stuff, video games, all that. But the rest of the house is normal. I mean, aside from maybe if you go buy the DVD collection in the living room, yeah. pretty geeky, all that stuff. <laughs> Geek Matrix DVD box set there staring back at you and all that. But, I mean, it's all pretty geeky-looking stuff there, too. But in general, the house looks fairly normal otherwise. And I call it the boring part of the house. You know, bedroom's pretty boring, except for, like, a stack of, of comic books next to the nightstand. The mirror on the ceiling. On. The no, no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. The uh, crushed velvet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the boas that I yeah. wear when I go around the house. Woo! To... Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's just, it. it's, I do it because I just, I love being in this mini Cybertron that I created for myself that's that's so categorized. It's It's insane. Like, I look at it. And the only time people have ever really seen it has been uh, television shows or people who've come by to show the collection on TV or something. And I mean, I don't take their reaction too much to heart because I know they've never seen anything like that before, but they've also never seen probably a lot of my other friends' collections either. I mean, someone like Brett's or Don's would be equally impressive to them or even yours, Duran. So, I mean, I don't really go, yeah, my collection's awesome, because I know it is, but it's just at the same time. Not like the dude that, uh, that's out there. I'm sure a lot of people's read. <laughs> uh, uh, he's got like 400 figures, and he's seeking a Guinness Book of World Records record, and everybody's just laughing at him. It's like, seriously, what, dude. Like, AJ, <laughs> that guy, AJ, that you're referring to, I mean, more power to him if he wants to. Um, it's based through ignorance, obviously, in his case, where... I mean, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but it's just, uh, you know, he does what he, I mean, the only thing that I have a problem, and we'll go to the why in his case, from what I read on him, because I read quite a bit and there was a lot of fallout with that, but I mean, he said the why for him was, is he just enjoys it because he enjoys the hobby and he loves it. And he had his wall of carded figures, which to me is always a big no-no personally, but I mean, I, I don't mind like a, a little bit of like go bots or something being used at the top there but i mean i don't like to uh waste wall space at all um but him it's just more it, i think it was just an assumption from his from his standpoint without really knowing the phantom i mean one one criticism that i gave him and it was the only criticism really was when he was counting his collection um he was including uh for each unit was including trading cards as a single unit and I was like, you know, like, that's his whole collection right there if we're talking just, and that, that's one of three books. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking just G1 stickers. We're talking, you know, uh, special Japanese cards and stuff like that. So, I mean, just my card collection is 2,000 maybe. I mean, just the animated arcade cards are like 400 different cards right there. Yeah. So... I mean, but in his case, the why, because he enjoy. I think he likes to soak it up, and he had a very beautiful collection from the photos I saw in the video. You know, he had, he had nice displays, um, not, not something I'd personally want to do, because it was like a big display just for like, just for Fort Max. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I enjoy just soaking his, it up. His why was more for exhibition, I guess is what you yeah, could say. Yeah, it really was. He, and, 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 and his was really just for exhibition, because if you watch the footage... Um, he just have these like singular, nicely colored. Like he'd have a light box with white with red walls for the Autobots, and he put like three figures in there. And I'd be like, Ugh. you know, like me, me. That's that that makes me cringe from my own personal standpoint. But from him, if if that's what makes him happy, you know, that's cool. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just like I said, more power to him. I think he's a little ignorant of of the big picture of what's going on out there in terms of the size of collections. I like to feel that I have a huge collection, but even me, I don't feel I have the biggest collection in the world. I have a pretty good idea of who that is, which uh, I might as well shout him out. Mia Boy Toys in Vancouver probably has the biggest collection in, in the world. Um, it's big. And, you know, it's pretty funny because he has stuff that, like, you got to got you gotta have time and money. And I don't got – I got money, but I don't got much time. <laughs> you know, so, like, it's a two, when so, you're tracking – 
Well, whose mean, collection would have been, whose collection would have been bigger? His or the Hartmans at their at their peak? Who do you think would have been the bigger? The Hartmans. The Hartmans were collecting every lucky draw mini con. The Hartmans weren't collecting. Yeah, he's he, he's that level. That's wow. What I'm saying. Well, that's why. That's why I said like. Remember that I, episode we did about uh, about different types of collectors? He's the hyper collector. <laughs> yeah, like, but and well, he has a he has a very good job. Um, I don't want to go into his personal life, but I mean, there he he is where he is for what he is. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to knock the guy, but he is like just from that statement, he is where he is because of that. Um, and he's got a lot. He's he's really like I mean, I'm not dropping four hundred dollars on an unpainted lucky draw mini con from kids day festival 2002 you know sealed and like there's there's certain places that just i that that money could go elsewhere at that point um i mean i don't mind dropping bitcoin on some stuff but there's there's certain venues i would not go and uh but that being said like you know going back to that aj guy it's just he he's not aware of those individuals let alone me or brett or don or you um, you know, and, and I mean, when he said his collection is huge and it was, you know, and he broke it down, it was broken down in this article. Uh, and it, I think like it only came to about 400 figures and then he counted comics and then he counted memorabilia and then he counted a kite. And again, like cards made up for 200 of that a thousand, you know, it's that I could name literally like on all my fingers and toes, people that have bigger collections than that. But you know, maybe someone that has never gone to a BotCon, TFCon, DairyCon, DF Expo. Opened up your Internet Explorer. <laughs> yeah. Or well, that, or you know, type Transformer Collector on Google Images or something, you know, like. He sounds like me pre-1994. Oh, before, yeah. Before sounds I, like I, and I've, I've not read anything about this gentleman, so I'm not knocking his desire. I'm just saying but it's that, it just sounds like before I went to my first BotCon, I didn't know anything about the Japanese world, the European world, the variants from Argentina. My life and my knowledge was based on the Marvel comics. I the came, I came a lot, and, uh, a lot and later and than and that, and that and Don. I came a lot later than that. I was, I was one of those that, whenever I first got on the internet as an adult collector, uh, it was uh, in mid ninety nine, I guess, and uh, I was you know, perusing ATT and I was a member of bot talk and, um, you know, everybody were, were faceless usernames. I didn't know general, unless they specifically mentioned where they were from. Most people seem to be mentioning they were from New York or, uh, Los Angeles, you know, places like that. Um, I, I was well, especially, very... especially the old the old board system really didn't emphasize on location or yeah. you were just a screen name. Yeah, and I was very naive and and feeling and, and and knowing that I didn't really run into a lot of collectors whenever I was out and about hunting things down. I was very naive in thinking that I was one of the few people in Kentucky that even remembered Transformers, let alone even had a collection i uh, naively believe that i'm i probably had the largest collection and you know in a way uh i might have because you know by 2006 i had well over 2,000 figures you know um i've i know i've mentioned many times how many i had so i don't know if orson's collection was near that big at that time i don't know if brett's collection was near that big at that time it's quite possible I may have had the largest collection in the state of Kentucky at that time. But it wasn't until later on, whenever I started going to more message boards and actually talking to people uh, on a more individual basis, uh, that I started learning, hey, there are some people that's closer to me. I learned about some people in Tennessee, um, you know, and then eventually I met in St. Galvatron, who actually lived here in Kentucky with me. Uh, you know, he, he lived within an hour of me. And I'm like, holy crap, you know, another another Transformer fan. And through those interactions that I grew and realized that I was not alone. Uh, so unless you do those type of things, and, and now Facebook makes it a lot easier to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of people out there that don't do social media. That Quite frankly, they stay away from it. Um, and they don't even go to message boards. 
it shocked me the first few botcons that I've been to, uh, that I went to, that people didn't even go to message boards. I'm like, how did you even know about this show then? You know, it's like, it's how I learned about it. And it was That's like interesting. from word of mouth, you know, and and stuff through their local collector friends and uh, and uh, and it just it just blew my mind that there's people out there that just don't interact with other fans online. Uh, their fandom is entirely in house, and it kind of lends into our discussion tonight. You know, uh, I'm sure there are collections and uh, like that guy, the, uh, the AJ guy that we, we were talking about. Um, you know, for him. You know his his in his mind he was a super collector and he displayed his toys in uh, or displays his toys in a way that he expect uh, expects other people to come and enjoy them uh, more so maybe than himself uh, but there's people out there that uh, you know they uh, they don't necessarily they're 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 just the opposite they. They want their collection only for themselves. They they don't care if anybody else sees it. Matter of fact, they don't even want anybody else to see it. So that's they just, kind of where I am in a lot of ways. Yeah, they they display it. They display it, and, and and quite frankly, there's some people that don't display it at all. I've known collectors. Uh, there was a friend of mine um, several years back. He had a very small collection. Uh, he loved Transformers. Uh, he had a few on his computer desk. But most of them were in a box. He just kept them in a box in a spare room. Didn't even display them, you know. And um, I think later on he uh, he would display them more after he saw what uh, what my collection looked like. Uh, it spurned him on to actually put them out. But me personally, you know, whenever I display my toys, uh, I, I, I get what you say about having, you know, someone else that, you know, like a repairman or somebody over and, and seeing what you have. Um, I love to see the reactions, but I would feel nervous. But Well, and, I, and, I've, and I've yet to have ever a problem because maybe because it's just uh, because of the location thing and because it's Montreal, Quebec, which is very French. Uh, repairman is usually a French Canadian, uh, disconnected from that culture, mm -hmm. so they don't get it. Um, usually an older guy, uh, but there was once and only once, and it was actually it was pretty uh, pretty cool. Was uh, one of the Bell guys came to like set up the internet or something, and he was like an older Spanish man, probably about 40s, 50s, and he saw one of my uh, Ultraman figures. <laughs> And then, like, he was like, oh, when I was a kid, I watched Ultra 7, and me and my father cried on the last episode. <laughs> you know, that was that was kind of cool. But, I mean, in general, you know, it's, I, for me, it's more of a, it's more of a concern. Like, you know, it's like the secret of what's really in your basement. Yeah. You know? Well, not, embar not embarrassment, just, you know, knowing, knowing the, the combo to, to the vault now, you know? Yeah. Well, it, whenever I was married to my uh, my ex-wife and uh, we were living in our first apartment, it's whenever I had that huge collection. Uh, it was a very small apartment. And like I said before, uh, I had them in every room except for the toilet, Don, and uh, the, uh, uh, the kitchen. I didn't have any in the kitchen. I didn't have any in the bathroom. Uh, I had a couple totes in the in the walk-in closet, and I even had a tote of empty boxes in the laundry room. So literally every room was filled with toys, and and there was a couple places where I had those totes stacked from all way uh, from the floor all the way to the top of the ceiling. And <laughs> I don't know how many times my wife and I would order pizza, and the pizza delivery guy would come over and open up the door, and I'm sitting there. Uh, opening up my wallet, paying him for the pizza, and he's like, I, I remember one one time this guy was like, "Oh my God!" He said it just like that, and I'm like, and and I saw that he was looking in my in into the living room, and he's like, at first I thought he was more impressed, and I guess he kind of was. You should have just turned to him and just said like, "Oh, we just moved in." Yeah. No, <laughs> no, he said it. His exact words, it looks like a Toys R Us exploded in there. <laughs> and I was yeah, a little that's... bit embarrassed by that, that statement. Well, I didn't uh, say and, it, and, but and, I was. And, rightful, and rightfully so, because I would imagine that um, 
you know, we all love our hobby, but I think that just as much as we love our hobby, we want it to be the best it can be. Mm -hmm. And for it to be a mess or for it to be in boxes. I mean, I've always felt me personally, if you have to leave it in boxes, you probably shouldn't own it at all. Yeah. With the rare exceptions of like some people that really do heavily have a space issue, uh, 90% of Japanese collectors uh, keep their stuff stored away. Because they can't really, they don't have the luxury that we do in America, in North America well, in general. You know, I was I was talking to uh, Insane Galvatron um, about a week ago, uh, and he has displays, and he but he doesn't display everything, and uh, you know he he's always been like that. You know, there's always been the pile, and you know m much like what Brett has behind him, you know he's got the pile, and there's stuff that you know he just doesn't. There's no ur there's no sense of urgency uh, to display it, and he's fine with that. And I asked him, I said, well, if you don't display it and enjoy it visually and or once in a while get it out and mess with it, what's the point in owning it? And he said that a lot of the stuff that he has, uh, and I, I hope I'm quoting him right, but a lot of the stuff that he has is just to have it, just to know that he has it. It's like, I want this set... You know, like we'll take the the Coneheads for example. You know, you know, you get Starscream, you got to get Thundercracker, Skywarp, Thrust, Dirge, and Ramjet. You know, um, you might not necessarily want the other guys, but because you got one, you got to have them all. And that was the mentality he had for so many years. Now he's changing the way he uh, he collects, but um, he still got all those figures. Uh, myself, you know, I mean, I, I collect mainly uh, for myself, you know, to, I display the stuff the way I want. It's organized, like you had, like you said, Daniel. It's organized, but in a way that that appeals to me, makes sense to me. I mean, there's some things that are like, why is that on that shelf, you know? Uh, but it makes sense to me. But while I don't have a lot of outsiders come in and see my collection, when a fellow collector comes in and sees my collection and 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 is blown away, and I, I don't necessarily worry about them as much because I know they they probably have similar feelings about their collection. You know, in in that um, you know they're they're afraid of people stealing from uh, stealing again or what. So I'm not and, necessarily and I will worried agree about with you. Them. And I will agree that is a good feeling, though, because in general, um, of the people that have see been in this room, 99.9% .9 of them are not collectors, mm -hmm. uh, don't get it, don't understand it. They're floored by it, but again, they'd be floored by half of this. You know what I mean? They'd be floored by a quarter of this. So, the, you know, the, the few times that I w have had people that, I guess the word I could use, would appreciate it. Um, that always is a good feeling, though. Yeah. Uh, well, but, but but that, but that's such a small number. Like, because most of my friends that have been here have known <laughs> that I've been like this for 25 years, so it's it's not surprising to them anymore. It's business as usual. Uh, but the few that do come in here, that it's the first time they've ever seen it, and they are someone that's heavily well, into geek it's, culture. Well, it's happened to me a couple times. Uh, uh, there's been two different collectors. That's came over to my uh, my apartment since I've been here, and they walk in. Uh, actually, no, I think three. I think the third one did too. Uh, they come in and I flip on the light, and they and I've got it rigged so all the all the cases come on all at the same time. Um, so uh, you know everything lights up automatically, and they walk in and first uh, their first is usually. Oh man, this looks awesome! This is awesome, and then that moment when they start whipping out their phones and taking pictures of it. Every time, I, Every I'm time. like, I'm like, that. That's a really, that's a really cool feeling. <laughs> it really is. And you guys yeah, who are listening to, to me, that have to, done to that, me, to me, to me, that I, I is the you. opposite. Though. <laughs> to me, that when they start pulling out the phone and taking a lot of photos, that's honestly where a little part of me gets a little, yeah, because, uh, and it's more so because. I know that they're locals. They know where I live now, and now they'll have on their phone, "Hey, check out this guy's collection." Mm -hmm. You know, you know, and it's I, just—I don't I necessarily don't know, worry about that. And I don't want to say it's an anxiety or anything. It's just that 
Because again, I, I have an alarm system, and an animal is always a good thing to have too. But it's just, it's there's so much, there's so much, you know. You know, that it's just the like, way I look at it though is if somebody wants something and they're going to, and they really want it bad, they're going to find a way to uh, to get it. Uh, I live, I live in a very busy apartment complex. My landlord literally lives directly across the parking lot from me. I, you know, I have a straight line of sight to her, uh, her front door. And uh, my own pickup truck, I keep it locked every night, uh, was broke into right in front of my apartment at the uh, at near daybreak. You know, people coming and going, going to work, coming home mm. from work. Somebody broke into my pickup. They didn't steal anything, but uh, it was locked, and they went through the trouble to break in my pickup. You know, it's like, wh- Why? You know, and the thing is, is if somebody really wants something, they're going to find a way to get it. Oh, totally. But that, but, but. I think it, in my case, it's more it's the ignorance thing is that they won't want it if they don't know it's there. Yeah. So in, in this case, someone might have broken into your pickup because they saw a five dollar bill on the, the passenger seat. If it wasn't there, or if they didn't know it was in the uh, in the mm-hmm. glove box, they wouldn't have done it. Same thing where to me, it's more just that, but you know. I, I'm very uh, social and friendly with all my neighbors, you mo- and all of them are mostly old people. <laughs> yeah, I live I live in a very white bread kind of uh, rich rich area. It's all, you know, just very friendly people. None of them have a clue what is in that house. Yeah. None of them. As far as they're concerned, I'm just some friendly white guy that says hi, how you doing? You know, who's a mechanic? You know, that's that's the only thing they really know. You know, but if they don't know. Like, and it's funny because when I do conventions, I do them like almost by the c- cover of night, where my my buddies come over. We all park in my driveway and we start loading up the car. But it's like it's 5 a.m. in the morning before they <laughs> and, get out of bed. Yeah, yeah, no one's up yet. And if 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 one of the neighbors woke up, oh, what's that Arsino kid do? Uh, uh, are they are they putting boxes in the back of that truck there? So you know, it's. <laughs> All that I think contraband. they still don't know, despite the fact that that's been going on for about I don't know, almost ten years now. So, yeah. but either way, it's 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 fun. It, again, to add the, the the final answer of your why is why I do it for myself. I it it gets my rocks off just looking at this stuff. I really do. It's just I, like I said, I, I just love just staring at it. Yeah, it looks amazing. I gotta, I gotta throw this question out there for the listeners, you know, uh, listeners and the viewers. Why do you display your collection, or do you display it at all? Uh, like I said, there's some people out there that really don't display them at all. Um, uh, but why do you do it? Is it on? For, uh, is it for your own personal enjoyment? Is it for exhibition? Uh, is it for both? Um, why? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can tweet us at TFYLP or post it on our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash TFYLP. Uh, we'd love to hear from you on that on that matter. Now, our last topic, um, I want to. I don't want to talk a whole lot about it, but uh, I figure we can go a good 20, 30 minutes on this, um, is the perspective of the people involved with a convention. Uh, and I think with the four of us right here, we've got a, a good round uh, view of uh, of things. Uh, you know, Don, you attended all but one botcon, so you can uh, you can fairly say that you are the consummate attendee. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and and Brett, you've been a dealer at many many botcons and TF cons and. And everything, so you've seen it uh, from from that side of the table for many years. Uh, for the last few years, I've been a dealer helper with our sponsor, Capture Prey, uh, so I, I have some insight on on that as well. And then Daniel, uh, you uh, worked with uh, Fun Pub with all Bot- of the above, <laughs> yeah, BotCon <laughs> last year, and you are active with the uh, TFCon. Uh, I, I I've been group. attendees to BotCons and, and I've been helping running tf cons i've been working with fun pub for bot cons i've been a dealer at tf cons in the past while being a staff where some years where if the light was low uh, like if the load was light that year i'd be able to sell instead and -hmm. stand at a table for a, a period of time and i've been all of the above in those cases 
Yeah. So, you know, uh, what I want to do with this is talk a little bit about the different perspectives. Uh, and I'm going to go with Don first from the attendee point of view, uh, simply for the, uh, for the uh, uh, fact that, that most people who are viewing and watching, uh, or viewing or listening to this episode are of the attendee uh, or prospective t- attendee uh, point of view. Uh, Don, what's it like? What What are your thoughts attending a, a Transformers convention? Uh, as far as um, your thoughts on uh, interacting with fans, why you go, uh, and and your thoughts on dealers and and staff. Okay. Um, in the beginning of Botcon, uh, when I went, when we started going in '94. I mainly I didn't expect it to be anything. I, I I expected it to be a one-time thing. It was the first time I'd ever flown, so I, I this was my one big. I thought, okay, this is gonna be a show. It's gonna be like you know, it's gonna wind up being inside of like a Hilton or a, a Holiday Inn or something, and it's gonna be a couple tables, and I'll meet some people on top. I really didn't know what to expect outside of your standard toy show. You walk in, everybody has tables, the, the old eight-foot lunch tables with, you know, all the stuff. So, I, and that's what I was expecting. And when I walked in the first couple of years after that 94 show, I went mostly to buy because my worldview had been so opened by that 94 show, by seeing all the stuff that I did. It, I would have never guessed there was that much product out there. So... The first couple of years, I was mostly there to buy. I think I told the story about me running through Chicago O'Hare, holding Star Saber, Victory Leo in the boxes, trying to make my flight and getting a lot of really weird looks. Um, so there's that. But um, it's a rare Japanese collectible. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, at the time, and you know, nobody knew nobody knew anything and about that. And, and even even in that even in that statement, that was even a different time then because it was. I find today it's a little more accepted, but back then it's mm-hmm. even more weird. Oh, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's why I went. And then when I when my collection finally st- I started not needing to be in the dealer's room all the time. That I was started going to and this is Beast Wars kicked in. I was really enjoying it. I never had the whole hate Beast Wars thing. It's just like, this is a new incarnation. I like the figures. I want to talk to the voice actors. I'm going to go. And then I started going to more panels, and I started really enjoying the show more because I wasn't tunnel visioned on buying stuff. you know. But again, back then, this stuff was more affordable because it was still everywhere in Japan. And, it, I, bu- and I bought Galaxy Zone for $50, boxed. So, I mean, mm. you know. So yeah, so Daniel understands. Um, but as I as I started going to the show more for the other things, I started meeting more people, making more friends, and the show really opened up for me. So my going for that one thing, I, I kind of wish I had done more. Th- well, there wasn't a lot offered in the early shows, but I wish I had done more than just stay in the dealer's room most of the time, wheeling and dealing. Um, one of the most important things about a show to me as an attendee, now I have set up before at a generic toy show. I've never done BotCon or TFCon. I'm tempted to at one point. I can force myself to do it. But uh, it's the scheduling of events that's one of the most important things. Because if you have a panel going on with person X and you have another panel with person Y and they're within the same time period or it ends one starts 30 minutes after the other one does yeah it's the like, early Bacons were guilty of that yeah and, and, but again they were they, they were constrained by the time the person had to be there the Hasbro crew how long they could stay things like that so the scheduling is the most important to me when they release a schedule I can say this is what's going on this is stuff I'm not really interested in because these last the last few Bacons that we had leading up to the end I didn't go to a lot of the voice actors panel because a lot of them were people I had already talked to, and they're great people. They're, and, but you've heard this, you've heard a lot of the stories before, you, and if you have a G one person there, they're, you're always going to have the question, "What was it like working with Chris Latta?" Which is always how, how did you get into voice acting? Acting, mm-hmm. and, and, and again, these are these are fine questions because 
uh, other than doing uh, the whole drive through thing, that got real old real fast. Yeah. <laughs> but hearing these stories, there's always someone new in the audience that's never, never heard these. And they need to hear these tales of Frank Welker dropping the quarter and doing an entire phone call. It was, it was, it was Frank or Chris it did it. Frank. I can't remember Frank, and then stories about Chris Latta and him him doing a Starscream or Cobra Commander voice at the wrong time or something. Uh, and you love these stories, but after a while, I skipped them because I'd heard most of the stories. And I was spending time with my friends or doing whatever the case may be. So, as an attendee, a well-scheduled convention is the most important thing to me so I can know when, when I need to be in a room for four hours from this panel to this panel to this panel to this panel or okay i can skip these panels so i can plan my up and my down times that's what's important um if you're if you're flying in make sure that you've got when when a convention is announced it's like again a few years ago when i was first at botcon and brian kilby and the guys on rfc the minute they announced botcon for the following year I was on my cell phone in the hotel room from that BotCon making a reservation for the next BotCon. I was doing it, and I do that. I mean, I, I, I get, I have a folder. I have everything in there. I have everything lined up. I have my plane information if I'm flying. I have my driving information. I have my road atlas. I have all that kind of stuff as well. So getting the information out, having it well scheduled is very important to me. Um with my length of time in the fandom, voice actors, I love talking, to, again, the voice actors. That's not the biggest draw for me anymore because I've heard what a lot. If someone's not been to a show before, like Buster Jones. I was at mm. Buster Jones panel because I had never met him before. And he didn't remember a lot about the series, but what he did remember was very interesting. So, but again, that was 20, 25 years ago. I mean, no one remembers every detail. Um so that's important. A good selection of guests, a good rotation of people. So if someone's locally and they can be there every year, that's great because, again, everybody's year is someone's first year. But, you know, just there's that. So being an attendee is fun. I've always liked the dealer's room. I like going and talking to people. Uh, the schedule is very important. The transportation issues need to be ironed out so we don't have any um, – Cluster flubs like you know other shows have had, uh, where you're 20 miles away from the hotel and there's no way to get there, um, things like that. But that's what's important to me. Uh, and just making sure and on, and we've talked about Hascon. That's one reason I really <coughs> PO'd about this whole Hascon thing is that the information we've gotten up to the last couple of weeks was nothing, and we're three months out. You can't make any kind of plans getting this close with airfare, transportation issues, budgeting, and you're still three months out, and then you finally get the information, and it's like... It's a big investment on, on a what-if. Yeah, it, exactly. it's, it's... And that's the one thing you... I mean, I took, I took a chance with BotCon, and I was rewarded with a life-changing experience. Meeting John and Carl, being part of the fandom, meeting all the people that I know, um, all the you know, but you, Even that first BotCon wasn't a big investment. <laughs> exactly. And again, like I said, I had flown, flown for the first time. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was, it was 94, I was 24 years old. First time I've ever flown. First time I've been anywhere other than up to your majestic country. On a, on, a, on a French class field trip, by the way. So imagine me speaking French. Mm. We? So uh, there's that. So that we we y'all. We we y'all. They basically they basically said it's okay. We speak English. I said thank you because all, all I could ask for where the bathroom was. And oh thank I God. We the toilet. <laughs> so anyway, from an attendee standpoint, that's the most important thing. Uh, one other thing, a well laid out dealer's room if you have a crappy laid out dealer's room that you have no way to get around it's going to be a frustrating experience for the buyers and for the sellers and no one's going to really want to be in there long enough for your sellers to make money on a re on a regular basis it'll, it'll be busy stop busy stop busy stop you don't want to be at a show like that because it kind of sucks 
Yeah. Now, what about your uh, thoughts and interactions with dealers and staff at conventions, Don? I I guess being at BotCon since the beginning, this is this is a kind of a stretch. They knew me. Hmm. Every, you know, after a while, they knew who I was. You know, I am Headmaster Don. Perhaps you've heard of me. Um, no, so, no, I don't know, you know who you are. Yeah, Brian, uh, John, and Carl knew me. All the dealers knew me. Uh, Tony, I consider Tony Preto a, 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 a. He's not a good friend as far as local because we're on the opposite coast. But I know Tony, and he knows his stuff. So you know, I, I, I know David. I, I've met. So many people that there's are my a good friends. there's a good fifty percent of the Bacon dealer room that were regulars every Bacon uh, exactly and, and I'd say uh, and 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 I wouldn't be over exaggerating by saying it was it's a good fifty percent yeah. consistently I would say up, up until the o- OTFCC and then the early fun pub years when they started moving around a lot more that's when you had some dealers who couldn't. Uh, make it because of location and all that because there were several years like big bad couldn't go because of the, the location of where how far they were away um you the staff need it's working a convention on the other side i believe you could say is a lot like working retail which it's going to be a a headache for everybody involved if there's a lot of emotions everyone needs to remember they're trying to put on a show they're swamped and they need to remember, you're confused, you're trying to find the stuff, the program's not clear. Why sign- can't you do this uh, specifically for me? <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. And then, or the signs in the hallway aren't clear, or the, the ballrooms aren't well labeled. You have four ballrooms, but it's the ballroom on the other side of the complex that wasn't labeled or something. You know, weird things like that. Yeah. Um, but you got. But you need to remember, and also when you're, we've talked about this, when, when you would go to a dealer room, treat your dealers with respect because they. This is this. That is no museum. That stuff's for sale. That's their livelihood, or at the very least, an important uh, addition to their income. So they wouldn't be there if they didn't need to be there or want to be there. So when you're talking to a dealer, be respectful. Don't say like. I'll give you so and so, but Brett, with you with you being a dealer, would you if someone said, "Hey, I'll give you five bucks for this," do you do you want them to say that? Would you say, "Hey, could you take?" I mean, does it make a difference to you the way it's phrased with you being a dealer? Those two guys, it's no. always it's always been important to me that you don't say, "I'm valuing I'm valuing your stuff less because I'm cheap and I, I'm a cheap ass bastard." I'll admit it, but I but I've always tried to be fair and like if it's seven i'll ask for five i won't say i'll give you two bucks that's just being insulting well first of all i've always said you can never insult someone with money i still believe that um because you just say no but the one thing that kills me and i don't care if someone says i'll give you two bucks for that or will you take two bucks for that it's the one semantics. that uh, the one that i don't like is Busted! It's just it's it's floppy. It's just it's not it's not worth it, it's not worth anywhere near that. I'll, yeah, I'll give you two bucks, and then you'd be like, if the price is right, fine. But yeah, yeah there, there's a there's a proper there is a little etiquette to it. It doesn't really have to be. Uh, I'll give you or will you take? That doesn't bother me so much. Um, but a little respect is nice. But I still I have go two. right back to what I said before. Uh, you can't insult someone with money. They're giving you money. I have two I that just always take my money. money. Okay. Yeah. I've always had two that bother me. Number one is um, someone coming to your table, and this is uh, this has happened to me many times as a dealer, and them going, uh, "Could you? Uh, you know, uh, they don't like the price of an item, and they'll say, "Well, that guy over there selling it for right," and I'll be like, "Well." <laughs> I mean, then go buy it from that guy. <laughs> you know, I've, I've never I've understood. That. I've never understood that logic. And whenever I say, and then I've said that to them, well, then go buy. Oh, but yours is in better condition. Well, then that's why you know X is X and Y is Y. You now, know, like it's, now, it's I'll admit, that. I've done that one, once or twice. But I did point out, like you know, the, the toy was this. Uh, it was a Nightwatch Optimus Prime from the 2007 movie because I wanted one box. Two that's dealers had one. Yeah, two dealers had one. One was fifty. Well, both were fifty. 
one guy had a box that was a little a little worse shape, but it didn't bother me because it's all on the back side. And I asked him, "You ha- yours is fifty, his is fifty. You know, I'm trying to save a little bit of money. The damage does not bother me being where it's at." I asked him, "Could you take?" And this was several years ago, of course. Said, "Could you take 40? And he took forty. So I did just point out that I did find there was some damage on the box. They both were the same price, and I, and I was polite about it. Cause you were, it, but, but you I, were trying I, to get a discount based on condition being worse. I have right. people wanting to get a discount oh, yeah. on on an item yeah. being better. Um, again, again, it, it's, it's again high, in, a, in a logical plea, and and the second one that always bothered me, and and that one too. It's it's always like it it floors me that it that it even exists. Is you have people that come to your table and they'll be like. Can you take five? Let's say the item's ten. They'll be like, "Can you take five dollars?" No, sorry, man, it's ten dollars. Five is all I have. No, I'm sorry, man, it's ten dollars. All right, opens his wallet. He has ten dollars. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's. He has twenty dollars. You, you could you you right away peer into the the wedge of the wallet and see the the row of greenbacks. <laughs> yeah. And you go like, you know, like. Did, there's the respect thing as mentioned before. I have to say, I've done that. Uh, you know, say, you know, I'll, I'll be like, $30 is all I have. Uh, and then I open up my wallet. See, that's all I have. Oh, <laughs> and, and a moth flies guys, out, you know. I <laughs> say that that's all they got, and they'll be lowball something, and it's not what they got. They're just, they're trying to get. And again, you could respect a guy for getting as much mileage as they can out of their money. But at the same time, like, I guess you came to the wrong table, you know, like this to, to me personally. I, I do. I do have one. The, the one thing that aggravates me the most. Um, it always happens on Sunday. Right at the end, you start packing it up and they go. I, I give you $10 for that so you don't have to pack it away. But I, I got $50 on it. Yeah, but then you don't have to pack it away. And I'll, <laughs> yeah, I that, will. That. Pack it away. You, yeah. you. I just look at them and say, "I'll live to fight another day." They, they somehow think it's now or never. Well, at that point, they do. They, you, you know, well, you don't have to take it home. It's okay. I'll take it home. It's not a mint and I'm okay. Fort Max. Yeah. That's that's going to be a hassle. It's usually a loose figure or something yeah. that's going to go in a Ziploc bag and back into the box. Buddy, buddy, I'm okay. Well, well you know, not worrying about me. I uh, the thing, the thing but, is, I don't want to specifically talk about more. Of uh, you know, you know uh, pointers uh, or uh, what you, you know, see. Let's let's yeah. talk about more of uh, of your interactions, that your past interactions that you feel. How do you feel about you know how dealers are? I mean, you know, sometimes dealers are pretty hard about making deals. I mean, you, you know, we we've all experienced a botcon dealer that you go it's up a and you make case and, basis, and you I make. Find out. Well, I mean, there's there's some that you that you make make anyone a fair inter- offer, and they anyone they won't budge on with, anything. Um, what's his name from Super Toy Archive? Oh my God, if, why is his name on the tip of my head? Yeah, Bickmore. Thank you, Alex Bickmore. I was actually uh, getting done, to that, but that's okay. And, and if and if you don't know who Alex is, and I mean here, <laughs> if my- you're just a, if you're just a person trying to buy from him. You will assume you've just had a rude experience. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? Well, I was going to say that one of my first experiences at BotCon, my first BotCon was 2000, and he was there. And I said I didn't set up. I was actually there as a attendee, and I've got the big wide eyes, and I'm looking at everything. It's great. And he had something I wanted, and I'll never forget, very rude, and he, he kind of caught me off as kind of goofy. And I'll never forget, he took my money, and he – Threw it on the floor, and That's, I'm like, "Well, what? I happened to look, and the whole floor was covered with money." And and it was, I swear to you, it was that point I thought that is so funny. He's well, fine. Just, he's just nuts. That's yeah, exactly that's just what I thought. Some people, if they will encounter him yep. for the first time, will be like, "Well, what an asshole," you know. <laughs> But you have to understand, he's out of his goddamn mind. He is. You know? oh, yeah. he, to the point that it's like, why are you even here, Alex? <laughs> like, but it's funny. You clearly are not having a good time, you know. But, but and and this we're talking like 15 years of this from my perspective, to the point that it's 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 hilarious. Oh, yeah. And I mean, 
I'm I'm happy that he made his way to uh, to TFCon um, TFCon Canada, not Canada, USA, just to to still bring his his light and his enjoyment. But either way, point being is <laughs> there's there's certain dealers that are you know like again when I mentioned before with Don like there's certain guys that were returning faces over the years and they all have their own different personalities tony has his personality tony presto you know uh, uh david has his own personality alex alex bickmore has his own personality hydra has his own personality anyone who's ever had to and i use the air quotes communicate with azusa <laughs> has his own personality. you know what i mean how oh, much that, is that how much is fun. this five dollars no 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 <laughs> yeah yeah, you know, he takes it away and puts it back. Takes it away, <laughs> takes it away from no, 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 no. <laughs> and then puts it back. Yeah. yeah, like again, it it's a case by case basis. Each everyone is a very colorful individual from different parts of the globe, um, and I think that that almost if if it, to me it almost adds to the charm because you're not just dealing with the same guy over and over, but <laughs> but yeah. Um, I'll tell you one of the, the funny things that I did um, back when uh, I guess it was was it Cybertron that had the first Unicron or was that Energon? It was Energon. Armada. The first ever Unicron toy was Armada. Was Armada, yeah. Okay, Armada. And uh, it was in the big box and no. I had it sitting on the top shelf and this kid came by, and I could tell. He's looking at his dad and pointing up, pointing up, pointing up. He wanted it. And I think I had 55 bucks on it. And um, he's like, I, I want that. And I'm like, what? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. He says, I want, I want, what? And he you know, hide behind dad, and dad would go, go on, go on, tell him. I want that. I'd put it down. And his dad would see $55, and uh, he would start getting the money out, and he'd go to me, and I'd say, offer me less. And he'd just kind of look at me. His dad was getting the idea. I said, I bet, I bet I'll bet i take less. And he's like, well, you, you take 45 I was like, I don't know. I, I think I'd take less. He goes, would, you, <laughs> would, you, would you take 40 I said, man, you know, you're bending my arm, but okay. And I handed it to him. He thought it was the greatest thing in the world. No, he just that's thought awesome. it was just the greatest thing in the world, and I thought it was funny. Um, and I love that stuff. Yeah. Um, I got I got a story. Yeah. I'm gonna tell real quick. Uh, I think we all know Brad. That well, Darren, you know Brad. Yes. Uh, Brad's such a great guy. He was selling at, at TFCon, and he had the Optimus Prime that turned into a Nerf gun. That 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 role play toy. Uh, I think it was TFCon Charlotte. Uh, I mean, uh, no. Uh, Chicago. Chicago. And the uh, <laughs> little, little boy walked by, and Brad was just playing with it. And that boy said, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And Brad said, you know, well, it, you know, I told, he told his dad it was $10. And that boy would just look with these big, huge eyes. I, and the, his father started to walk off. And I, this kid was just so transfixed. Buy this prime that turned into the Nerf gun. I said, "Sir, I'll give him five bucks if you want to pop sauce in the other five. Because that I, I that I had to have that kid had to have that Nerf that Nerf right. price. And I, I went ahead through the five bucks in because that made he was just like, "This is my uh, this is just." I think he said on the way going, "This is the greatest thing ever." We had so a uh, awesome. We had a big bag of mini cons. I mean, it was a huge bag. And we used to, when kids would come up, whether the parents were shopping, just grab one, grab one. And they'd grab one, and they get to play with it, whatever. Well, a lot of the kids would, you know, I'm, I'm not going to grab it, or, you know, so we didn't get rid of a whole lot of them. So as kids went by, we were throwing them in their bags, just <laughs> putting them in their bags. And so if anyone got some of that stuff, that's where it came from. It's not like they, they didn't steal it or nothing. We just, we literally were taking these things just because we were so bored and throwing them in kids' bags when they weren't looking or uh, throwing them at the dealers, a couple of the dealers, oh, stuff like be that. Better than, better than throwing G1 Acepticons across the room. How? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm sure most of the BotCon people will remember the early days on, on Sunday afternoon. 
the dealers would just start taking random insecticons and just throwing them out to the crowd. <laughs> so, so Brett, um, what about? Is there anything that you want to that you as a dealer uh, want to talk about? Uh, like anything that uh, I know we've we've talked about some great stories, but is there anything that maybe on the on the negative side that that you might want to mention? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, uh, I'm gonna first. I want to tell one thing. I want to say one thing that that Don said that really hit home when he talked about the layout of conventions and everything, and. Um, Daniel, you agree with this, that a lot of the layouts do make or break a convention. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, and I know you like Joe Lanta, Don. Mm -hmm. That was the, the, I went once, wait a minute, I went once, and that was the most disorganized, horrible layout I've ever seen in my life. I, I agree. And it made it very hard to do anything there. Oh, I totally agree, but also in a weird kind of way, it was almost like a treasure hunt. Because you were going from room to room, seeing, and you were surprised. It's like, oh, this room won't have anything. Boom. You had all these dealers in all these little corners. It was like, literally, you were hunting for treasure in all these different small banquet rooms. Well, it was it was kind of I, I do understand that, but from a dealer point of view, it yeah, really it sucked. sucked. It sucked. <laughs> Especially if I, like, found something and I had to go back there. Because then I'll be five minutes trying to find it. No, it took me 20 minutes because I couldn't remember which room it was in. It, it's, well, they did like separate rooms for the dealers. Well, think about separate ballrooms, very small, oh, and they had them in all of them, and then they had them in hallways connecting the twos, and it was yeah. it's just really bad. It's that the was like the Indiana small. Comic Con that uh, that uh, Orson and I went to uh, uh, a few months back. Uh, we went there, and the the dealer room was literally in multiple rooms. There was I want to say there was four good sized rooms. And then it was all in the hallways too, and it's like that. This was horrible. that's very similar to this. It was it was just bad. It was yeah. bad. But my other thing I wanted to say, and I want to actually, I'm going to get rid of this rumor, this this that they everyone thinks that the dealers get the best deals from other dealers <laughs> because they get there first. Um, it happens one of two ways, and I've done this, you know, and it's it's true. If if another dealer has something that I want. That I want, and I've always been honest about this. If I wanted it, I would literally tell them, I want that for my collection. What's the best price you can do? And nine times out of ten, you get the same thing. Ah, the show hasn't even opened yet, blah, 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 and all that. I'm just asking you what's the best you can do. All right? It, 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 I've always done that. If, if, if I have this item and I have $20 on it, but on Sunday I'll do $10, trust me, on Friday I'll do $10. I, I don't wait to the last minute. If I if I know what I got to get out of it, a sale and you is meet a sale. that, take it, take it. Um, but there are dealers out like that. So for that that stigma that people think that we can get all these great deals and everything, there's some dealers that just won't sell because they don't trust you. You're just going to resell it, or you're just going to do that. You're going to bother to do that. So that's just something I wanted to throw in there because they it does happen. The reseller logic, though, doesn't never make sense to me because if, if if by their logic, say item X item is thirty dollars, you're asking for twenty, and then they say, oh, he's just going to resell it, then, I mean, for for you to pick up product to just make ten dollars in that moment, you know, it's yeah. it doesn't make much sense. I don't know why people would accuse someone of that. I can understand if if you were lowballing a, a low product. Yeah, but they trust me, they do. Um, well, here here's here's the thing. You being a dealer in the room before the doors open, your discount is you being in the dealer's room before the doors open and getting first shot at it. No, don't get me wrong. I understand that. You know, you know that. Oh, that, I 100% understand that if you're there first, you get first dibs. But there yeah. are some dealers that will not sell. Oh, yeah. I won't sell yeah. to dealers. And they'll do that. Now, me, I don't care. And I'll tell you right now, I don't care if I sell you something and you go and you make $100 more on it. I don't care if you take it out in your backyard and burn it. I don't care. A lot of people get all bent out of shape over that. Look, did you get what you wanted out of it? Yeah. All right. Shut up. I don't care what he does. And that's that's my mentality. If, I, if that's what I wanted out of it and I got it, I don't care what you do. It. Now, I agree. And the, sa and the sale will happen one way or another anyways. I I'll tell you one other little thing, too. Because uh, I'm going to be straight honest. H have I ever bought something at a show that I knew I was going to sell? 
Absolutely. But I personally, and I say this for a fact, I will never buy something at a show and sell it at the same show. I never do that. Because I'm always afraid that it's going to look bad. I won't do it. I'd rather take it and go to another show with it or do whatever. If I bought it because I knew someone wanted it, fine. But you will never see me buy something, walk right over, and put it on my table. That's fair enough. That's just- now, uh, as a dealer experiencing cons, I know you mentioned uh, last week or, or well... Uh, who knows when this episode will air, but uh, the the last episode we recorded, you mentioned that there there is some really big negatives and drawbacks to being oh, a yeah. dealer uh, yep. at conventions. What are those? Um, I can't remember the last time I went to a panel. <laughs> I, I literally can't. I think I think one time I did, and I got yelled at for it. But uh, <laughs> uh, oh no, he, he's right though. He's right. The, if there's yeah. one thing, because there was I only only one TFCon I ever did it as a dealer, even though I was technically still staff, but just because I had the free time, I was like, you know what, I'm going to sell. Um, but the double edge of that sword is you're tied to that table for the next three days. Yep. You know, like yep. literally, like if, if you got to go pee, if you got to go grab a bite, you got to wait someone for somebody. Else, oh, don't, yeah. don't forget about that yeah. too. All right. Uh, you got no panels, um, no autographs, um, you, you, uh, food, it's whatever you can scrounge or you brought in your lunch pail. If somebody offers to go get you food, you're like, you are a godsend. Yeah. Oh God, you're, you're, you're going to pay them well. Thank yeah. you. Here you go. Take some stuff. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's just, by the way, if you ever want to get on a dealer's good tonight, right through their stomach, there you go. So, but yeah, you miss a lot. Um, and it gets to where, um, you're at the end of the day, and that's the other thing, because um, you really try and play yourselves up. I mean, I one of the things I always do is, you know, we do the parts party, room to room trading, and this that, and the other. Man, it's a lot of work, especially when you've sat at a table for what eight hours, and then you want to go out and do that. Well, I mean, as a convention goer, hey, you can go back to your hotel room and relax. You can go to the pool. You can go do whatever, and then come back. Go sightsee. You are tied. You're tied. To that room. Yeah, well, when, when especially for a dealer, when the dealer room closes, the attendees go back to the room. They go to a convent. They go to a panel. Whatever's happening, dealers have breakdown time. You know, let's say let's say it's Saturday and he still has Sunday. He still has to check. You know, okay, what did I sell? Move some stuff around. They're they're probably there for another hour, hour and a half, just making sure everything's okay, counting up the money. You know, making sure they're still good on change. There's so many factors that you know you could say, well, dealers get the ultimate early bird, but it comes at a price. Right. It comes at a major price. Well, and then the other thing is, is in in my uh, experience, circuit circuit. Uh, what happens to me? It's a good day. What happens to me is, is I also have staff. Mm. Okay, well, I gotta get the staff fed. We gotta figure out what we're gonna do. Gotta make a game plan because most of the staff that I have, they get there and they, well, I wanted to do that panel. I wanted to do that. Okay, as long as I have someone here, you go, you do this, whatever. And so it's a little bit of organization. So believe it or not, there's there's super supervising involved. There's you Leadership. know a game plan. Well, and and all this stuff. So it happens, you know. You, even even though you know, it's like I, you know, I, I've, I've said, you know, I'm I've been a helper with Capture Prey for uh, for a few years now, and I go in to a convention like, for example, TFCon or no, it wasn't TFCon. It's was, uh, BotCon 2015 uh, up in St. Charles. Uh, I wanted to go to the Frank Wel- Welker panel and a couple others, um, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Orson was like, sure, you know, just, just let me know you're going and, you know, you can go. It's fine. But the problem is, is that you get on that dealer room floor, uh, or, I mean, you're, you're working that booth and sometimes, you know, these, you know, you don't, you don't, you lose total track of time sometimes. Oh, totally. Uh, and you know, it's like, you don't even know it's past lunchtime until, you know, you're getting like two, three o'clock and you're like, why am I, why is my stomach hurt? Oh, I didn't eat. You know, it's well past lunch, you know? Um, so you lose track of time. I know that some, some conventions, they call it out over the intercom, but if you're dealing with a customer at that particular time, you may not hear it. Uh, or if you're, if you're, 
doing a transaction, you just you're not paying attention to you know loudspeaker what's going on. You know, I don't know how. I many find times with I find with most I've, conventions I've from opening time to two p.m. it flies. Mm -hmm. It just and then it kind of crawls a bit afterwards. But I just find like ten to two. You blinked. Yeah, but and Sunday just lasts. Long story. Yeah, long story short, though, is I uh, that twenty BotCon twenty fifteen. I went to zero panels because by the time I realized the panel or uh, thing that I want uh, thing that I wanted to go to, uh, uh, that that it was getting near time or something. I real by the time it was I realized it, it was either half over or past time. You know, it's like it ended 20 minutes ago. Damn. You know, that is really, really frustrating. And, you know, a lot of people sit there and say, oh, well, you know, you get early discount or, you know, early early uh, looks at stuff, you know. Um, and you do. Somet sometimes, yeah, sometimes, though, you just, you uh, the only time you see the con is if you know i'm going to step away for five or ten minutes and walk around and i don't know how many times you get walking around and somebody will come up you know that that's working to do oh uh somebody needs a break you need to go back or somebody has a question no uh you know can you go back and answer it you know it's <laughs> brett hey, knows this <laughs> hey, you you know this for a fact because you saw me doing it uh i mean how many times i get about halfway out the door I get called back, and I just I I, I just want to go to the bathroom. So I just want to go to the bathroom. You can run back. You'll get away. You'll run over, and then maybe you'll actually get to go to the bathroom. Then you come back, and then all of a sudden, ooh, there's something at this table, and you start to go over this way. No, 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 no. You go back to this way. You go back to your booth. So you're you're always you always seem to be tied to that booth. It's like the, it's like the ball and chain. It always yeah. reels you back in. Well, so, and then, then, then there's the also one. the people that you know if if they know you from a particular booth, you're walking around, you're trying to shop yourself, and they see you and they'll come up. Hey, do you all have this? Do you have that? How much is it? I don't know. I don't have everything memorized. You know, if you know if it's like something really popular, you know that everybody is is clamoring for. Let's say. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, fans project culture uh who was it uh tarn i think whenever it came out you know I, we was at a convention and and you know i was walking around and somebody uh, people were asking me y'all got that uh, culture figure how much is it i knew because you know we had it you know and it, it was it was a popular item I had heard it a lot but you got to understand i'm there too and i'm trying to do the same thing you're doing you know, but I, I I can't make a deal because somebody's coming up and talking to me and saying, "Hey, you know, ha, uh, you know, do you have this?" Or and then also as a dealer helper, I'm not a dealer per se. I, I just help. I have no control over you know prices or anything like that. You go up and if uh, you know, with me being a capture prey helper, I'm wearing a capture prey staff shirt, and you go up to another dealer and you're trying to make a deal. And they're like, okay, I'll give you this deal, and it, and and it's like you make a deal, you know. It's like I'll offer, you know, uh, something fifteen dollars. I'll offer ten, and they're like, okay, well, I, I'm I'll do that. But hey, if you if you give me a deal on this right here, uh, I'll I'll give it to you for five. Well, that's awesome, but I have no control over that. I can't do that. You know, if I was Orson, yeah, <laughs> but you know, and that gets frustrating as a dealer helper. You know, uh, people people want to haggle with you more, or are less likely to haggle with you because they may have came to the booth and wanted something, and Orson wouldn't deal with them. You know, wouldn't come to the price that they uh, they wanted to agree on, and they left with a bad taste. And they see me, so they pass that bad, you know, uh, you know, their their bad feeling, ill feeling onto me, and it's like I'm 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 not capture prey, you know. I, <laughs> I have nothing to do with you offering him twenty dollars for a fifty dollar figure, and him rejecting it. You know why? Why are you penalizing me? Uh, sometimes, I, and I have actually ran into that before, um, but that gets really frustrating. Uh, Daniel, as as staff, uh, I'll come back to you, Brett, because I, I know you. I think you got something else you want to say. Eh? 
No, or, go ahead. Or, okay. Uh, um, Daniel, as staff, uh, what's your feelings and uh, uh, what's the biggest drawback as being staff to you? I find that um, one thing, but you know what, and, and I'll give credit to people, they see it. They see it on our faces. <laughs> um, very tiring, uh, especially by the time you get to Sunday. Uh, we kind of have like a, a zombie look to us. Uh, most staff have this like expectation, which is totally understandable, though, to be going at full steam all hours of the day. And what I mean that is because, to give you an example, we use TFCon as an example. You know, we got to be there 6 a.m. on Saturday morning for the lineups, for registration. Friday's one thing because Friday's an evening thing and it's pretty simple. But Saturday, Sunday, we got to be up early. Friday, registration, take money, watch doors, make sure uh, guests are where they need to be. Hey, uh, you know, Mr. Cullen, Mr. This, do you need a cigarette? Do you need this? Do you need to go? Do you need to go to the bathroom? Do you need this? Do you need change? Do you need food? Do you need. So those are for the people who watch guests. Door watchers, they got to be always, you know, in the know, watch over people. Um, when you're handling any kind of currency for the convention, whether it be for, for purchasing of items that are like the T-shirts or something, or whether it be just actual registration or, or, or tickets to get in, uh, we have other separate rooms like the panel rooms and stuff. Those two also have door watchers for them. Everyone has a, a, a job, and there's a lot of jobs that also are the ones that aren't the day of the show. Um, whenever you go to charity auction, there's a lot of planning that goes into that outside of the day that charity auction starts. The sorting of the product, the making sure everything is set up. Uh, when you're talking, even reading uh, the comic or the, the program, there's someone that you know put that together. Uh, when you go to panels, panels are put together by staff you know, outside. Everyone is always running, and I find that it's the week leading up to the show that everything goes into overdrive and craziness, and we practically don't even sleep. And it's our own fault, in a sense, because we know that we got to be up at 6 a.m. to do everything on Saturday and Sunday, but we also are at TFCon, and we don't want to have to go to bed at 10 p.m., you know, because we want to enjoy ourselves. So we end up finding ourselves going to bed at 2 a.m., having a good time, waking up four hours later. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the point is like, you, and I'll give respect to all the attendees. They see how some of us are just, uh, you know, like they just, they see how like, if, if almost, if you don't see me like that, then I didn't have a good time. You know, <laughs> if I have a smile and I'm spry, I probably didn't have a good time yesterday. So, but there's a lot that goes into running shows, even a one day show, the amount of, the amount of time and effort planning of uh, floor plans, advertising, lanyards, you know, just, just every land, empty lanyard's got to have a little, you know, thing put in. And, you know, that's, that's manpower and work, you know, every, there's so much involved in doing shows. That's why there's a lot of people who do conventions. They do one and then they never do one again, you know, because they realize it's a lot of work. It's not a one man operation by any means. It's a lot of times it's, it's a lot of people, a lot of volunteers, a lot of just, a lot of just labor, just labor, and then labor that, that doesn't even happen the day of the show. Everything that it just has transpired on the outside of it. Doing a floor plan is not easy. You got to get your dealers, make sure they pay on time, do the floor plan. God forbid the day of the show when you present them their table, they're not happy with where they are. <laughs> and then you got to dance around. Hey, uh, you could you switch with him because he wanted a wall. And do you mind if he has a wall and, then, you know, instead of an island set up or a booth set up? So it's 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 never, never an easy thing. Um, and it just it consumes a lot of time. Uh, I know for a fact that probably the one thing that I do get to enjoy as a dealer excuse me, not as a dealer, as, an, as a, uh, a staff member, is we do get to enjoy the panels, usually, but mostly it's uh, <laughs> it's kind of like how an usher gets to enjoy a movie. We just happen to be there more out of job than it does out of uh, out of out of our own personal needs. Your attention needs. isn't fully on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so like when you go to see Peter Cullen's panel, it's more because all hands on deck need to be at Peter Cullen's panel, less than... Uh, right, less but than then we... 
then you, you get called to duty. You might yeah. have to do something. So you, you might have to be the guy. It. I would hate to be the guy who wants to see Peter Cullen's paddle, but you got to watch the dealer room door, you right. know, or you got to be the one who's watching Dan Gilbazen. Let's say he, you're his liaison. But that being said, you know, everyone kind of chooses where they want to be to begin with. It's not like it's something's handed to you and it's like that's what your job is and that's it. People people choose where they want to be and stuff and and um, I find that. Uh, with Bacon, when I did stuff with them, there was a lot more freedom, but it also there was a lot more staff, a lot more. Um, well, I guess because now Bacon isn't a thing anymore. A lot more staff that wasn't Transformer fans that that was useful to have. They a lot of the they didn't care about going to they panels didn't care, or anything. Right. Yeah. So be, and they and because they had such a good glut of that of of these very nice, I don't want to say old ladies, older ladies. That were that, and such a good crew of them that they were able to have so much people to cover the really important jobs that you were able to bow out, go check out a Hasbro product preview panel, you know, and stuff like that. Where, um, and I was lucky that everything that I did with Bacon was behind the scenes, so I wasn't really needed on the floor for anything outside of that. Um, I wasn't a door watching guy or anything like that. That was for the church ladies, <laughs> as I like to call them. Um, but, with, but with TFCon, it's always been there's so many jobs that need to be done because that's a smaller show and it's more dependent on that smaller staff. Um, but you do miss stuff. You do. Like, I, I find that um, during that time that people would say, oh, look at, you know, Brett's get that, Brett gets that advantage to check out the deal room when it's first opening up and stuff. I find staff, we don't really get that because that's when we're busy setting up everything. When Brett is getting his table, we're making sure that table's even there. You know, making sure there's skirts on it, making sure that he gets to his table. And right, then, there's, well, I was going to say, there is one, one positive thing, because I've been a convention helper also. Um, not, not planning and everything like you have, but I have helped. And one of the things is, is you get some unique experiences. Oh, and Frank I'll, I'll, every once in a while, <laughs> when I got to drive around with Frank Welker yeah. and talk to him one on one, the whole ride from his hotel to the airport, we picked him up. He wanted someone had to be with him all the time. I, you can't put a price on something like that. Yeah, it if was amazing. So, if you're someone uh, who really likes voice actors, um, and you haven't shown to the head of staff that you're a fanboy of said voice actor. You put yourself in a really good off. Look, I would have never imagined, you know, five-year-old Daniel, if you would have came to him and said, one day you're going to sit next to the micro machine guy for eight yep. hours. You know yep. what I mean? Like, you know, before it was even blur in my mind, because I, even though I saw the movie, I didn't know it was the same guy. But you, I would have never known that I was going to sit next to him, talking to him about the processes of, uh, <laughs> of guarantees for, for dealers and stuff, like for dealers and, uh, and voice actors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would have never thought in my wildest dreams, you know, watching Beast Wars back in the day, that I'd be sitting next to, you know, Cheetor for eight hours. You know, while j just shooting, and same thing even with Richard Newman uh, at last TFCon Chicago. J you know, Rhinox, uh, just sitting with him, just talking about music. You know, for hours on end. Um, and and I'm not someone who's like crazy about voice actors, but it's definitely something you look back in retrospect and go, wow, like these micro celebrities in your mind and you got to spend such an intimate amount with them while the people who lined up and paid for their autograph only got that like that that window like two minutes to just go yeah. thank <laughs> thank you sir scribble i like your stuff they might get five minutes if they really linger but in general we're us it's literally we're stuck next to each other whether we like it or not even if i don't want to be with him mm -hmm. we're with you know, I'm going to be with Richard, and I loved Richard. I'm not. I don't want to throw him under the bus. But I mean, whether I like it or not, I'm going to be with Richard Newman for eight hours today, mm -hmm. handling his money, and and making conversation just to just to help the day pass. Because in between the, the sea of uh, of fans getting autographs, there's the quiet periods, and so you got you know to pass the time. It's like so you know did, you know we usually we'll have like a stack of flyers or something, or someone brought in. Um, 
because Richard Newman's Canadian and so am I. So someone brought in a stack of flyers uh, from the States, just like of Walmart and everything. And we're just going like, wow, candy's so cheap. And just a like whole conversation from that, you know, candy's so cheap in the States. That's crazy, you know. So it's, 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 it's unique in that sense. But I find that the people that are usually assigned uh, to actors are people who are very dedicated to that. Uh, just to give a shout out with TFCon, like Phil, Phil, who's Decepticon Army on the boards. He's someone who's very, he's usually in charge of liaison for, for voice actors. He's someone who's really good with that, very patient with them, helps them out. Um, I mean, it's a great experience. It is. But, but the flip side of that, I'm stuck to that guy for eight hours. If I wanted to go shopping in the deal room, which is in my eyesight, I can't. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we've talked about some really great things here uh, and some great points of view that maybe the listeners uh, who have uh, attended conventions or maybe people who are thinking about con- uh, attending conventions, um, maybe we've given you a little bit of insight uh, as to the different points of view. Um, from, you know, the attendee, the dealer, the staff. Um, maybe it, m- it might help you have a little bit more perspective on what things go on. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people is like, well, I, I assume a lot of this, but maybe you don't necessarily know what goes through our head. I mean, it's like that, uh, that fan that uh, at, uh, at like 2 o'clock, 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you've got this bewildered look as a dealer or helper or staff, you're very tired already. And it's like, well, the show's only been going on six hours. Well, you wasn't here four hours prior to that setting up. Uh, moving you know, all the boxes of stuff yeah. prior on the Thursday. Moving every, you know, like there's there's so much setup. Yeah. How did those tables get there? And then How what, did those toys on the table get there? Yeah. How did the people? behind the table of the toys of God. And them, then you know? also have to consider like uh, like uh, you know at Capture Prey on Bacon 2015, we had room sales uh where you know we had we were selling stuff out of the room. So, yeah, once the con was over, uh That's we cool. had we had like 30 minutes and we'd go and sell till 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night and then turn around and get like four hours of sleep because we'd Thank go you. to go to the room and sit and talk and and the next thing you know, we're all snoring, you know. <laughs> but the, the oh, fatigue. everyone! I think I think that anyone who's ever been a dealer at a show falls asleep out of exhaustion. They yeah. never just fall asleep. It's yeah. just it's more pillow head to the pillow gone. Yeah, you're out. Or or, or in my case, in uh, at Botcon uh, or not Botcon is TFCon USA, the very first one. Uh, we we were drinking some uh, 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 plum. Vodka. I don't know what no one plum vodka. It was uh, plum wine from Japan. It was it was the real stuff. Well, I made I made the mistake of eating the plum. Oh and, my lord! And uh, I, I I I was told that uh, I sat there catatonic for uh, for a while. Uh, we had some visitors come to the room, and they they. They were all sitting there talking, and I just got up, walked over to the bed, face planted, face first, with my ass in the air, and started to, uh, and and fell asleep. And everybody's standing around talking and everything. And I'm passed out, farting, <laughs> oh, <I love> it. <laughs> because I'm just passed out. I'm like, I, I can't, I can't confirm nor deny this because I don't remember it. <laughs> But I, yeah, I'm a lot. Convention tip number seven: don't room with Duran. <laughs> well, that's that. Or, yeah. or at least leave the window open. Yeah. But uh, I hope we've given you some insight as to uh, the different points of view of uh, of convention life. Um, and since we're in full swing of convention season now, um, think about these things as as you go around. Um, also, uh, I hope you all enjoyed our little discussion on displays early on and uh, hope that was helpful in your insight to those. Well, with, uh, without further ado, uh, for Megamus, Headmaster Don, Proto Man, I am Weird Wolf. Uh, we will see you next time on TFYLP. Good night, everybody. Night, everybody. Night.